All right, just to remind everybody, this uh, a week from Saturday is the men's prayer breakfast and deacons meeting, and then on the 19th, Thursday the 19th, uh, Jim Myers will start a series on Psalm, Psalm 119, and also that night Jeff Phipps is going to give a, a report on his trip to Brazil, which sounded like that was very effective, and then starting... Um, uh, to, what Saturday, this Saturday, the training for the Fort Bend County Fair evangelism event takes place. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so we can make sure we're all in right relationship with the Lord, and then I'll open in prayer. Our Father, we just thank you so much that we can be here tonight to look at your word, to be challenged by it. Father, we continue to pray for our nation. We pray for our, our uh, president and all the advisors, and we pray that you would just foil all of the horrific ideas and plans that they have, and that you would just make it apparent how evil uh, their policies are, and that we uh, cannot be a nation, survive a continuation of this. Father, we continue to pray that you would pr watch over and protect uh, President Trump as he's out, and uh, so many people want to um, just destroy him. No matter what it takes, they will do anything. We pray that you would just protect him, watch over him. Father, we pray for those who are in Ukraine, the people that we know and um, have ministered to over the many years, and just pray that you'd watch over them and give them great opportunities uh, for your word. And Father, we also uh, pray for Israel. We pray for Raleigh Morris and his ministry and their safety there in the north. And we just continue to pray that you would give wisdom to all of the leaders. And Father, we pray that there might be a real exposure of the evil of Jew hatred that is uh, taking place in this country and that that would cause people to wake up to what is happening. And so, Father, we pray tonight as we study your word that we might focus on our responsibilities as believers we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, tonight we're going to get into this uh, last section, the conclusion. There's a conclusion and then an epilogue at the end of, uh, at the end of Philippians. And as we get into this co conclusion, we're going to get into a, a favorite topic for many people, and that is people testing, how to handle people testing. And everybody has to deal with people testing. I often wonder what it must have been like for the Lord Jesus Christ to have lived in a world surrounded by sinners, fallen people, fallen parents. Can you imagine growing up and all of your siblings, and he had quite a few siblings, and they're all sinners, and they're all uh, probably difficult to deal with. I think there's a good reason why we don't know anything that really happened other than his little adventure when he stayed behind in Jerusalem to interrogate the rabbinical council. But it's what, what that must have been like. We can only speculate because we have no information whatsoever. And we know that his brothers, at least two of them, did not become believers until after the resurrection. And probably the same could be said for some of the others. But it just must have been quite, quite a challenge. But we're never told anything about that. Every now and then we see situations when he's having to deal with Peter or, and something that Peter said, and yet he always, thank you, Sandy, he's always... Uh, patient. He's always relaxed. It shows us that that is how we should handle uh, these kinds of, of challenges. Uh, he was, when he grew up, when he, after he had bar mitzvahed, which would have been at 13, then 
he would have apprenticed to his father. And so what we know from the location of Nazareth, that it was uh, four miles or less from Sepphoris, which was a very large Roman city that they were building at that time. And it's all made of stone. And people often misunderstand, and it's really poorly translated. When it says that Joseph was a carpenter, uh, the word that is uh, translated as a carpenter is the word tecton, where we get, it's part of the word architect, okay? And it's a builder. And they build with stone, and they built with wood, and they built with metal. So he was, would have been apprenticed to Joseph, and it's likely Joseph could have been in charge of a, a team of workers as that work went on for about 25 years or so building, building Sephora. So we've gone there on a number of our uh, uh, trips in Israel. So he had, uh, would have been around a lot of other uh, unregenerate people. But we don't get a, any kind of glimpse except, as I said, with one or two of them, uh, two situations with a couple of his disciples. But later on, we see the Apostle Paul. And we do get a glimpse of Paul dealing with a personnel problem and a, a conflict with young John Mark. When Paul and Barnabas were going on their first missionary journey, if you look at Acts 12, 12, and that next section, you don't need to turn there. But if you read through that section, Paul and Barnabas had gone down to Jerusalem, and they had gone to the home of uh, John Mark's mother, whose name was Mary, one of the many Marys you can get confused about in the New Testament. And, and that was where Peter had gone. Earlier in chapter 12 tells about Peter, the angel coming and letting Peter out of pr prison there and going and knocking on the door of um, Mary's house. And everybody's in a prayer meeting and Tabitha comes out and says, who's there? And he says, Peter. And she goes running back to tell everybody nobody believes her. And so that's a, that's a situation. So when Paul and Barnabas go back north to um, Antioch, they took young John Mark with them. And then when they got ready to go on their first missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them, and so they did. And so he's kind of an assistant to help them along the way. And uh, But it was too much for him. They ran into opposition from people in, on Crete, and then uh, when they left Crete to go up to um, Asia Minor and go up to Pamphylia, then John Mark decided to go home. And so when they got done with that, and they went back, did their report from their first missionary trip, and they're getting ready to go on the second trip, uh, we get this glimpse of what was going on between Paul and Barnabas. We read, then the contention became so sharp. Earlier it stated J Barnabas was determined that John Mark was going to go with him. So he's got his mindset that John Mark needs more training and he would thought he should go. And the contention became so sharp. And that's this word here. Parax we get our word paroxysm from this. Paroxysmos. And it means to have a sharp disagreement. The root meaning is a convulsion. But it's a convulsion in this relationship between Paul and Barnabas. And so it became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. So there we see that there were personality conflicts and conflicts over, over decisions. Now there's not, no emphasis or even a hint there that one was right or one was wrong or one was being sinful and one wasn't. There's no indication, uh, indication of that at all. But this is always a problem. When people get together, there are always difficulties, disagreements, and conflict. And the reason for that is because of sin. 
<clears throat> so we come to our passage in Philippians chapter uh, 4, verses 2 and 3. And this is all that is said about it. We don't know much more. Paul says, write, writes at, the, at this transitional point at, towards the conclusion of the epistle, I implore you, Odia, and I implore Suntiki to be of the same mind in the Lord. And then he addresses this companion, this person unnamed, I also urge you, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So what's interesting is it's somewhat ironic that these two women have these names. Uvodia is a name that means someone who's prosperous or it has to do with somebody going on a prosperous journey. And it's, uh, those are the ways in which uh, scholars usually interpret her, her name. And Sudiki means a pleasant acquaintance. But their relationship is anything from pleasant or prosperous as they are uh, they're having a conflict with each other. We don't know what the nature was. We don't know if it's centered around something going on with the church because it's clear that both of these women seem to have some uh, arena of responsibility within the, within the local church. And they had worked with Paul. They says they labored with him in the gospel and with Clement. And uh, so they're involved with the, this group and they're ca causing some sort of disruption. And it's a significant disruption because Paul's hearing about it under house arrest in Rome. And so this is something that is threatening the uh, unity of the uh, church there at Philippi as well as the testimony uh, of that congregation. So when Paul sa starts off here, he says, I implore, he says it, uh, it's only used once in the Greek, but it's translated at twice, so we get the point. I implore you, you Odia, and I implore Suntiki to be of the same mind in the Lord. The word for mind is this word for neo, which we've seen numerous times as we go through uh, Philippians. And it uh, seems to be a major theme of unity, and they are responsible for part of the disunion and the conflict that is taking place in the con congregation. Now, if we go through, the, look at this verb in the book of Philippians, it's used 10 times, and it emphasizing thinking. And Paul uses it in several different ways, but he uses it uh, three specific verses to talk about being like-minded. Actually, it's about four specific times. And the first time in Philippians 1.27, uh, he really he doesn't use this word, but he's talking about the same thing. That's where he says, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So you've got one spirit and one mind. Actually, it's one spirit, one pneuma, and then one mind is one soul. Uh, and so they're striving together. And then in Philippians 2.2, 2, he says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So twice that's emphasized there for unity. And then we have it in Philippians uh, 4.2 that they need to be applying this. So he singles them out. That's not typical of Paul unless it's a major problem for him to single out somebody in the congregation by name and, um, and challenge them with what they're, what they're doing. Now, after Philippians 2.2, 2, we have an example of what he means by the same mind, and that same mind is the mind of Christ, and it's marked by humility. And whenever there are personal conflicts, it's almost always can be grounded in one or both or everybody operating on their sin nature and on, I want to get it done my way. So that is a major problem. 
So uh, in contrast, we're to be patterning ourselves after the Lord Jesus Christ and have the same kind of thinking, that he's not emphasizing himself. And so Philippians 2, 6, and 7, he even though he was, we studied all this, I'll paraphrase it, even though he was in the form of God, that is the essence of God, he had full uh, deity, he did not consider it something to be grasped after. In other words, something to grab hold of and maintain his hold on his deity in the sense that he wasn't asserting his rights. Well, look, I'm the son of God. I'm the second person of the Trinity. Why do I need to go down to earth and, and uh, solve the sin problem? That's not his mental attitude. So he made himself of no reputation and taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. That's how humility works. It has to do with authority orientation, and it doesn't have to do with making yourself into uh, some kind of weak person that everybody else takes advantage of. So he is obedient to the person in authority. So we all have issues with people testing. We have uh, many people in our lives. We have uh, our family members. We have spouses. We have children. We have grandchildren. We have parents or grandparents. We have all kinds of problems that can arise within those close, intimate relationships. And then we have another sphere of relationships at our place of employment. And so there are people you have to deal with there on a regular basis. And sometimes that's difficult, especially if you're not in a work environment where you have people who are believers. But it can get pretty pretty, uh, uh, rowdy even if they're uh, believers. So we have to understand the nature of people testing. And so I'm going to get two major points in. The second point has about 20 subpoints. We've gone through the subpoints. I've just rearranged them. We've gone through some of that today. So we have to understand this. This is critical to understand what we're talking about here in Philippians uh, 4.2, as well as what's going on in our passage in Ephesians on Sunday morning. In Ephesians 5.21, where it talks about being submissive to one another in, uh, in the, fear of the uh, fear of God. So how does that work? Because all of this relates to the same principles. So we start off with the basic problem. And the basic problem is our own sin nature. And it's a lot more cantankerous and robust than any of us actually wants to admit. So it's Our sin nature, that is its own category of testing. But here we're dealing with uh, the testing that arises in terms of relationships and not asserting ourself in a wrong way. You know, there's a right way to assert yourself when you're right and to make a case, but there's other times when we need to just be quiet, that we need to not assert ourselves and let others have their way. And I'm not talking about necessarily moral or spiritual issues, things that are at issue. But we need to understand that we should not always make things all about us. So we've looked at the sin nature many times, talked about it on Sunday morning. We have the area of strength, which is human good, where we think that we are really something and we have accomplished many good, helpful things, and that comes out of the sin nature. If you're not a believer, everything comes out of the sin nature. And there are a lot of unbelievers who are wonderful people. They're very helpful. They're philanthropic. They give to many causes. They uh, produce many things that are wonderful and helpful. They have great attitudes, and they're uh, a joy to be around. But it's all the works of the flesh. That's just where their area of strength is. And then the opposite is where we sin. And people have such superficial views of sin. We have three categories of sin. We have uh, mental attitude sins, which are the most destructive. We have all kinds of mental attitude sins. People who have anger and hatred, they're, they're resentful. 
Uh, they want to get revenge on somebody for something. And a lot of people are extremely petty. And you just say something wrong or not say something right, and the next thing you know, they're, they're mad at you or they're trying to get back at you for whatever reason. And they just wear, they just have their feelings getting hurt for the least little thing. But it's all about them. That all flows from just self-absorption and arrogance. Everything's driven by our lust patterns. And for a lot of people, the dominant lust patterns are sex lust, power lust, and approbation lust. They want approval from people. They want you to validate. They don't care what you think about anything. They don't want to uh, listen to your views on stuff. They, they may try to be polite and let you talk, but then let's get the attention back on them. And, and they want you to know what they're doing. And most of the time, they're just telling you about stuff because they want you to validate what it, whatever the decision is that they made and that they're not wrong in a set of circumstances, the other person's wrong and they just need to want to get a pat on the back. That's called approbation lust. And that joins often with power lust. They want to be in control. We have a lot of people who are just, uh, the term today that we use is control freaks. But, but they just want to have things their, their way. And that's all it is, is they want everything done the way they want it done all the time. And so that's just a power lust. And it doesn't mean they want to be in official situations of power, but they want to control what everybody around them is doing to make sure everybody does it the way they want it to be done. And then you have sex lust, and, we're that, and that drives our whole culture and the whole advertising business, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. And that leads to various uh, opposing trends that we've talked about. Uh, legalism on the one hand, which leads to moral degeneracy, and licentiousness on the other hand, which leads to immoral degeneracy. And we have a culture that, uh, what's interesting is you look at the psychology of, of these uh, activist on the left, and they want to tear everything down, and they want to cancel culture. Anybody that doesn't agree with their views, they want to get rid of, they want to remove them from society. That's just pure self-righteousness. And so that tends to, self-righteousness tends to operate more on the other side with legalism, but it's just as true for for people who are hardcore antinomians because they want to be legalistic about their re relativism, that they're right in their relativism. They can do whatever they want to in their relativism. But if you say, no, you really can't, then you're the enemy and they'll come down on you just like the Pharisees came down on Jesus. Because whenever you're violating whatever norms they have, even though they say, well, everybody has a right to their own norms, the, the, the footnote there is everybody but Christians. Anybody who has moral absolutes that don't agree with theirs is wrong. So here's our focus, though, is on that self-absorption. Uh-oh, I went too far. That self-absorption and arrogance. It's all about me. And we don't know what went on in the personal, uh, personal, personality conflict or whatever the real reason was for that. But Paul is saying that they need to straighten it out and they need to come to one mind and they need to put serving the Lord first and getting whatever it is they think they're going to get out of things, get rid of that. The focus always has to be uh, serving the Lord. And uh, years ago, somebody made this comment, and I thought it was right, and I've incorporated it many times, says, and, and that is that in any marriage, it, it takes two to get the marriage to work, but it only takes one to destroy it. And in any team, you just get one person who wants it to be all about them, and you immediately have a problem with, with everything else. And so this is a major issue, and it drives people crazy when they're involved in a project or their church or their any kind of organization, and there's always seems to be one person that wants to always talk about themselves and always tell what's going on with them and really doesn't focus on anybody else, and they always want to have their own way, 
and they want it done the way they want it done because they've got all these different uh, uh, lust patterns, approbation lust and power lust all working at, at the same time. So we have to understand that whenever there's personality conflicts, one or both are operating on their sin nature and they need to back off and apply the principles of humility from Scripture, confess their sin and reorient their focus. Now the second point is the long point. On the second point we remember that God created human beings in His image and likeness. Now there's a lot that we can say about that. God created us in His image and likeness. That has to do with our immaterial nature. It has to do with our uh, abilities to think. It has to do with our uh, abilities to make choices. It relates to lots of things. But one thing it relates to is that God created us to be social creatures, to be involved with other people. And that's very clear because when God makes a new creation, when it comes to the New Testament, it's the body of Christ, which is a very social entity. Now how do we know that this is part of God's image? Because God is a social entity of three persons. He has always been in a social situation. By social I mean where there are different persons involved in accomplishing projects. And so God is an eternal society of three. And there is intimate fellowship Jesus said, I and the Father are one. There's intimate uh, fellowship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit and that is eternal. It's always been that way. And so God wants us to have that kind of relationship as far as creatures can go and that's what we will have once we are in our resurrection bodies without a sin nature and we are uh, with, with the Lord. So one of the ways this is exhibited in the Scripture is the dozens of commands that relate to how we are to relate to one another. That's the social structure and those are the social codes for the behavior of Christians in the body of Christ. And when and and that's everything we studied in Ephesians talking about unity is actually echoed in other passages which which we will see. So as we get into this, the first thing that I want to look at is just this word of one another. And it has to do with one person as part of a group of people. And so most of the New Testament uh, epistles are written to congregations. There's a few that are like Philemon and Titus and Timothy and uh, 2 John, 3 John that are written to individuals. But most of them are written to congregations. And so they are being instructed on how they are to relate to one another within the con uh, con congregation. And by extension that, that relates to how we should behave in relation to any other believer because we're all in the body of Christ. There's local churches that are local bodies of Christ and then we're just one part of the whole body of Christ. So the overall command is to love one another. And actually I think all of these other commands are part of what it means to love one another. And a lot of these commands are what we might just call good manners, showing courtesy to one another. But the more self-absorbed that our cultures become, the, the less we have good manners or courtesy and the less parents teach these things to their children. And historically the reason, and I read this, I've never been able to go back and find the book where I read it, but I read this in the foreword to, a, um, to an etiquette book. I don't remember whose it was, but in the, in the, it, the, the introduction talked about how human beings are basically self-centered and that the reason we have etiquette and manners and decorum in terms of behavior is to restrain these arrogant tendencies that everybody has. 
And so that's its, that's its focus, and good manners are, are to be part of the Christian life. But this really goes beyond good manners, because loving one, one another doesn't mean just having a distant relationship with somebody so you don't get uh, upset by them, uh, because it, when we look at passages of Scripture, which I've done in the past, like the Good Samaritan, where you have the... Um, where you have the um, uh, Jewish uh, guy that is uh, traveling, he gets ambushed and beaten up, and he gets uh, waylaid by um, uh, some robbers. Then the first person that walks by is a priest. And the priest doesn't do anything. He just crosses over to the other side of the street, and two or three others walk past him. Finally, a Samaritan comes. And you have to understand this would be the kind of situation where you have a, a, it's 1868, or actually it had to be a little later, 1875, or a little later, you've got, let's say 1890, you've got Jim Crow laws in the South, and you've got a, a black person, former slave, walking along the road, and there's this KKK wizard down on the ground who's been beaten to a pulp. That's the kind of relationship that existed between Samaritans and Jews. Jews despised Samaritans. They were not pure, pure Jewish. They were part of the uh, many people that the Assyrians had resettled into the northern kingdom after they uh, dispersed the Jews that lived there into the, uh, all around the uh, Assyrian Empire. And so they despised them. They, they didn't accept anything from the whole Hebrew Bible, only the Pentateuch. They didn't want to worship in Jerusalem. They had their own uh, priesthood and their own, own worship on Mount Gerizim. And so they, they were just despised by, by the Jews. And yet here's this Samaritan coming along, and he picks him up, cleans him up, takes him to a hotel, pays the hotel fare, tells the owner anytime you need, uh, if you need more money and he needs to stay longer, let me know and I'll take care of it. See, that's what it is. That's the example Jesus gives of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. And so this is totally different from the idea that some people have that I can just sort of love people from afar. Uh, no, it means to actively pursue something positive in the life of that person, no matter who they are. It's not based on them. Love for the believer is never based on the object of love, the character of the object of love, uh, the personality of the object of love. It is based on God's character. That's why our love can have integrity. Otherwise, it's just like every other sinner. We love people because of what they can do for us. So the Love one another is the most common command in the New Testament. We find 15 distinct times that this is stated and other times when it may not be stated quite that precisely, but that's the same thing that it's talking about. John mentions it in John 13, 34, and 35. Paul mentions it numerous times. Peter mentions it, and we'll see all of these, all of these verses. So the 18 one another's are all manifestations of this one, one command. It involves humility, it involves uh, forgiveness, being kind to those who perhaps have not been kind to you, and putting up with one another. I like that translation, that's what it means. I think it's sanitized and people miss it when they read bearing with one another. No, that means putting up with one another. And a lot of times that is what you do with people you love. You know that they have their idiosyncrasies, they have their weaknesses and their strengths, and you put up with it because you love them. John 13, 34, and 35, a new command I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Now that's the tough part because we don't love them as we think they deserve. We love them as Christ loved us. And we think we're pretty special. But we're not. We're not any more special to the Lord Jesus Christ than the next person. The person that we kind of have a problem with. 
So we are to love them in the same way that Christ loves us. And we'll see that comparison numerous times. Jesus said, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, that is that love for one another, that you will know that, that they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the only time you get anything close to a, a behavioral characteristic of a Christian that is evidentiary for the truth of Scripture and who Jesus is. He sa- Jesus says, by this, by your love for one another, that is the telltale sign. That way you treat other people, how you love one another, that's the telltale sign. One another here refers to other believers. I think to us, loving your neighbor as yourself is repeated from the Old Testament two or three times, so that applies to those that are not necessarily uh, believers. So we don't get away with anything by saying, oh, well, you know, those people down there, they're just not believers, so I don't have to love them. Well, we do. We do. We have to love both. Jesus repeats this at least two more times in the next couple of uh, chapters, and all that's in the upper room discourse. He said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then in uh, verse 17 of chapter 15, these things I command you, that you love one another. And John repeats this. John was sitting right there with Jesus and with the other disciples, or walking along with them on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is talking. And he heard all of this, and he meditates on it, thinks about it for the next 60 years or so until he writes 1 John And 1 John is really a commentary on what Jesus taught them there on the road to Gethsemane. So in 1 John 3.11, 3.23, 4.7, 4.11 and 12, and 2 John 5, John writes, love one another. In Ephesians 4.2, Paul says, with all lowliness and gentleness. Now those are two terms for humility. With lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering. That's called patience for a long time. Putting up with something. He says, put up with one another in love. Long suffering's a good term for it. It's in the Greek, it's makrothemia, which means long on anger, long before you get angry. So we can only do this through the Holy Spirit. You, and I, this, for this to be a sign of the fact that we are disciples of Christ, learners, we're Christians who are growing, we can only do this through the Holy Spirit because that the kind of love that Jesus has for us is not something we can manufacture in our finite person. This can only be manufactured through the Holy Spirit. And so in 1 Thessalonians 3.12 we read, Paul saying, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. Notice he doesn't say y'all need to be loving one another. He says may the Lord do it because it can only come from the Lord and it's mediated through the Holy Spirit. This is what we see in Galatians 5.16. The command is to walk by means of the Spirit and you will not bring to completion the lust of the flesh. And then he's going to talk about the conflict between spirit and flesh and then the works of the flesh so you can know how sinful you are. And then in verse 22 he says the fruit of the spirit is and the first thing he lists is love. So the Holy Spirit produces this as we grow. Some of us think well he's taking his sweet time about it. But our volition's involved in that to some degree. So this is the process, and it's, a, it's something that God produces in us. Then there is the mention of brotherly love. So this is all part of the command that Jesus gave to love one another. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 we read, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So the word for brotherly love is Philadelphia. That's what the name of the city in Pennsylvania comes from, as well as the city in 
in Turkey, uh, Philadelphia. And the second time, and that's from the word philos, okay, philos. Philos means a good friend, the noun, somebody you, you care about. Phileo is the verb, and phileo is not exactly the same as agapao, which is the verb that, we're, that we have here to love one another. That's all, all through here, that's primarily the verb. But phil, the philos emphasizes something a little more intimate, a little more personal. Now what's interesting about this is that the other day I was talking with someone, a conversation, and something really hit me that didn't hit me when I was teaching on the um, on worship. Back towards the beginning I talked about a lot about the fact that we have made the worship of God too informal. But see, we and we and equate informality with familiarity and they're not necessarily the same and that every time that we see one of the uh, someone in the New Testament have um, have an encounter with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ uh, they're, they're like like Paul and John they're falling on their face it's not it's not this kind of situation where they just run up, hey buddy, how you doing? Let's go do this. And people get this idea from the context of John, this upper room discourse, John 13, 14, 15. Well, Jesus says he's now our friend. And I did point out that that word there, philos, emphasizes not some sort of buddy-buddy, intimate kind of uh, uh, famili- um, a familiar friend But it has the idea of fellowship. But I want to take it a step further because what we see is that, for example, if you go to Revelation chapter 3, I'm going to turn there. We have a a verse at the end of Revelation 3 that is a verse in Revelation 3.20 that you have many people think is a salvation verse. And it's not, and I'm going to show you why it's not, but that has application to, to this word philos or the verb phileo. In Revelation 20 it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Now eating together from the time of ancient, ancient times, we go back and we see God eating with Abraham. God who has two angels with him, they all sit down, they have a meal together. It is a picture of fellowship. It's not a picture of salvation. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that in verse uh, that we have to look at the context. So what's the context of Revelation 3.20? It's a letter to this church in Laodicea, which isn't that far from from Ephesus. And so there's a couple of verses in there that are really taken out of context a lot by people. The first one is in verse 15. And in each of these letters, let me back up a minute, each of these letters is basically a report card that is being issued by an observing angel to the congregation. And uh, Laodicea doesn't come off very well at all. They are one of the, I think there's uh, two or three that have nothing good said about them, two that have nothing good said about them. And Jesus is saying in this report card, he says, I know your deeds, I know what you do, and you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So people will interpret this as cold is that you, you're, you're really hostile to God and hot is you're very warm towards God, which is not right. Um, You've got to know something about the background. There were hot springs and they would have cold water running off the snow melt. And so they had hot and cold water in, in um, Laodicea. And that's sort of the metaphor that, that is being used here. But cold water is, is very usable. We like cold water. We like to drink cold water. 
Hot water is also useful. You can make instant coffee, you can make tea, you can make soup, you can do all kinds of things, and we want it hot. So hot's usable and cold is usable. But lukewarm, we don't like. We don't want lukewarm coffee, we don't want lukewarm soup, we don't want lukewarm tea, we don't want any of our beverages just kind of lukewarm. Cold, yes, hot, yes, not lukewarm. And so what do we do? We taste it and go, oh, pfft, spit it out. That's the imagery here. He's talking about believers. And we know he's talking to a church, but he's talking to a church that's like the Corinthians church that is really messed up. And so he says, I know that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, that means I can't use you because of your spiritual circumstances. And then he challenges him, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Now, buying, can you buy salvation? No. So again, it points out, this isn't a salvation concept. They're already saved. Now what they need to do is they need to learn the word and they need to uh, come under the obedience to, uh, uh, obedience to the Lord. So in verse 18, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves. All of this has to do with their spiritual growth and future rewards. And then he says in verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove. Guess what? The word he uses for love there is phileo. If God is the subject of the verb phileo, the object is never an unbeliever. He has agapao love for unbelievers, but he never has phileo love for unbelievers. So this is talking about that intimate fellowship. And he says, he says, uh, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. So he's talking to them as believers that he loves because they're believers. So this idea, Jesus is our friend, it's the noun form of that same verb. And so it's not talking about the fact that we have this buddy-buddy uh, friendship with Jesus now, and so we can be very relaxed about worship and everything else because that's just not biblical, and that's not what that means. What that means is that we can have a fellowship and partnership with Jesus because we are now in the body of Christ, but he's the head. He's not our buddy. He's the boss. And so that, is, that's, that helps us understand what's going on here. The brotherly love is something that is between members of the body of Christ. And we are taught by God to love one another. And how do you do that? As Christ loved the church. So that's pretty convicting, so maybe we ought to close in prayer. <laughs> All right, no, we won't do that. So in 1 Peter 1.22 we read, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love for other believers, love one another fervently. No, he doesn't say love one another passively. He says love one another fervently with a pure heart. That's, that's Peter. So all of these verses I've just gone through at the opening here are just verses that talk about what it what love for one another within the body of Christ is supposed to be. So if you're Euvodia and Suntiki, and you've been causing dissension in the body of Christ in Philippi, you, you, you need to read this. Because what you're doing isn't loving one another and has nothing to do with it. And you're putting your own desires and your own will and the way your own personality works ahead of serving the Lord. So when it comes to marriage, as I pointed out earlier, you, it only takes one person to mess up a marriage. But if both people are focused on serving God in the marriage, because the primary purpose for marriage isn't so you can have a buddy to go through life with isn't so you can have good times. It is so that you can serve the Lord together that in the Garden of Eden when God created the woman, it was to be a, an easer, a helper to Adam to do what God wanted him to do. 
And so the purpose in a marriage is that the two come together to glorify God together, but when one of them decides to not do that, then you're going to have problems. Well, that's what's happening in the church. You've got people who are there. Their goal needs to be to glorify God and pursue God's plan for their life and not to pursue your plan for their life. But once people get refocused on doing what they want for themselves, then we're going to have a a mix-up and there's going to be a problem with various relationships. So the second sub-point here, like I said, I've got about 20 sub-points. We are members of one another in the body of Christ. We are members of one another. There is a connection. I don't know what it is. I don't understand it. But for us to be members of one another in, involves a, a, a connection between believers. We have a responsibility to one another. People say, well, what? Yeah, to love one another. Jesus said that. And many other things related to one another. That's why we're looking at this. So in Romans 12, 5, Paul says, so we, being many, many Christians, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now this doesn't mean that we go around getting in everybody else's business. That doesn't what that, that means. It, that we are be, to be mutually supportive of one another towards the goal of serving the Lord, growing together in Christ, and growing to maturity. In Ephesians 4.25, which we've studied, studied a lot when we were going through Ephesians 4, uh, Paul wrote, for this reason, because you have already put off the lie that you're no longer the old man, you're now a new creature in the new man. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor because we are members of one another. So here he's using the word neighbor in terms of others in the body of Christ. We, because we are members of one another, we are to speak the truth to one another. And not buy into the lie of, of uh, divestment and equity, not buy into the lies of cultural Marxism, not buy into the lies of the liberal left or the leftists, not buy into the lies that come out of the government. We don't do that. We are to speak the truth, operate on the basis of a consistent Judeo-Christian worldview. And if you don't know what that is, that means you need to be in Bible class at least three times a week and listening to tapes every other day. You have to grow and learn how to think like a believer in Christ. We come to Romans 12.4, just to look at the verse ahead. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now when the Holy Spirit uses the same word three times in two verses, we need to pay attention to that. This is an important concept that we are members of the body of Christ and that means we're members of one another. That's not the only place Paul said it, so you can't say, well, maybe he just made a mistake. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14, he says... For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. This is like a a Super Bowl team. Now, they make mistakes when they're out there on the playing field, but they are a well-greased machine. They all have their separate roles on the team, and when they are doing doing it right, they're winning ball game after ball game, and they go on to win the Super Bowl. That is what a team does, and they work together. And they're not out there want, where each one wants the glory for, for himself. And that's an analogy to the body of Christ. And then it goes on to say that it is by means of one spirit that we were all baptized or identified into this one body. We're identified and placed into the body of Christ and we've been made to drink of one spirit. And so the body is not one member, but many. It's not all about any one of us. So this goes on. And then the next third sub point C is that we are to be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love. 
And this has the idea of, of being um, philostorgos. This is an interesting word. I, I didn't think about that this afternoon. I got some great pictures of storks nesting on telephone poles when we were in Romania last May. That's the second half. Storgos is related to stork and the love that a mother stork has for her um, for her egg and for her offspring. So we are to be kindly affectionate. That's philo, philos, there we get that word again. It's not a, an agape word, it's a philos word. And it has to do with the kind of devoted and affect, affection that a mother has for a baby or should have for a baby. So it has this idea of being devoted to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. You're not going to go to the head of the line. You're not going to go out to dinner with friends and always want to go to the restaurant you want to go to and all, all things like that. It's not about what we want. We, God has Think about it this way. God has given us the friendships and the relationships that we have so that we as believers can have a ministry, can have opportunities to have significant ministry in their lives. That's how we devote ourselves to them, is giving them the truth. Now sometimes it's difficult. You don't just hit people over the head. Sometimes it may take 30 years. Sometimes you just build a good friendship and hope that there be times when uh, you might be able to give them the gospel. You can't always just run into that part of the conversation uh, like you're driving a Mack truck because they're not going to let you back in. And so it just takes time. And I've told you the story many, many times that it took over 30 years of leading the man who was the commandant of the ROTC unit that I was in when I was in college. I, I gave him the gospel the first semester I was in college and I led him to the Lord long, three decades later six months before he died. It takes time. You don't just, you don't lead people to the Lord, but you can't, we can never forget. Maybe that's why God's put us with those people because that's his agenda. May not be our agenda, but that's his agenda. So we need to uh, focus on that. Fifth sub point, we are to be like-minded to one another according to Christ Jesus. This is the same command we've had all the way through uh, Philippians. We are to be of the same mind. We are to think the same things. We are to all have that humility that comes from our relationship uh, relationship with God. So in Romans 15, 5 and Romans 12, 16, we have Paul saying the same thing to the Romans that he said to the Philippians. In verse 5 he says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ. This is something that we should pray for. It may not be on your prayer list, but it should be on our prayer list. That pray the Lord that I can be like-minded, that I cannot be so self-centered, that I can't talk about myself all the time or get my way all the time, but I need to be focused on the fact of other people and their spiritual life and how I could be used by you in any way. Now that doesn't mean to go out and be aggressive about it. The focus there is just to be conscious of it. If most Christians became conscious of that, it would make a huge difference. But most Christians operate on their sin nature. They're more concerned with self than they are with the people around them. So we are to be of the same mind toward one another uh, verse 16, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. High things here refers to things that are related to arrogance. It's not related to having lofty ambitions in academics or some, you know, anything that you're in, but it has the idea of things that relate to arrogance because humility is talked about as being lowly, arrogance is talked about as being high. Uh, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Sixth one, F, accept one another. Therefore, accept one another 
just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Again, we have that comparison with Christ. Because when we look at the realities in Scripture, that as God looked at us from eternity past and saw us in all our obnoxious filth, God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, God didn't say, okay, you got to clean yourself up and then I'll take care of you. He said, you're pretty obnoxious, but I'm going to die for you. I'm going to send my son to die for you. So we are to accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Now G gets into some interesting terminology and I think I may stop here this time. It gets into, because we've got several other passages that use this in conjunction with other things. So I'm, it's already uh, 8.35, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here, and then we'll pick it up here uh, next Thursday night. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at these things and to be reminded of just how arrogant and self-centered and self-serving our sin nature makes us but that through the grace of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we might be transformed into the image of Christ. We need to learn to walk by the Spirit and get the focus on you, that we are here to serve you. We're here to focus on your plan and your purpose and not on our plans and our purposes. And that as we do that, you just enrich our lives in so many ways that we never thought was possible. And you bless us in so many ways that we never thought was possible. And we need to just put you first and then, as the proverb says, all these things will be added to us. So Father, we thank you for that and we ask that you help us understand and to see how to apply these things in our lives. In Christ's name, amen.